Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the August meeting of the Muckingham County Human Services Board. Uh, it's good to see everybody, even though some of them are behind me, and I guess I'm, I'm okay if we be behind me. Uh, but anyway, welcome wherever you are. We got your back. You got me back. Yeah, yeah we got your back. Uh, we are very happy to have officially now, Ed. We glad to have you with. The board has approved you as a member of the board, and we certainly appreciate it. Would you like to say anything, or I'm just thankful for the opportunity? And I'll be all ears today and pay attention. Mm -hmm. Very good. Glad to have you, sir. Would like to look at the uh, board agenda, where we are going to have to change because of a. Um, Person, one of the people on one of the uh, panel needs to be somewhere uh, quickly. Uh, we will be moving uh, number five up into the number four position and number four into the five position. Anyone have any questions about the agenda? I have a motion that we accept the agenda as amended. So moved. Moved. Second. Second. Any question? All those in favor say aye. 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 We have seen the board minutes. Anyone have any additions or subtractions? If not, do we have a motion that we accept the July minutes as uh, presented? So move. Move second. Second. Move second. Any question? All those in favor say aye. 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 We are uh, going to have the panel, as I indicated to you now, and Mandy is going to introduce them to you. And uh, we will be also moving at a certain time and so forth, and we'll be told how to we'll do that. And then when we do come back from those, uh, those various subgroups, we will remain in the subgroups uh, for the remainder of our meeting. So, Mandy? I am just going to introduce the concept. I think Lisa's going to introduce the panel, and I think the panel will touch on this. But <coughs> as we watched across the nation some incidents of violence in schools and large community settings, we began meeting as a group of anchor institutions or the larger organizations in the community and talking about how can we work together to assure that um, we are coordinating our resources and our effort and our knowledge to keep all citizens in Buffalo County safe. I'm going to let them talk about that. I think we're going to give you a hands-on experience, but I'm also going to tell you that this team won um, from the National Association of County Commissioners among 9,000 counties in the nation a Best Practice Award this year. Oh, wow. Wow. Whoever, this keeps getting passed around because Jim won't let any of us put a nail in the wall. It was a team effort. Everybody can have it for a month. At least a roll is okay. Great. So um, we have you in groups today, and we're what we're going to try and do at the end of this presentation is actually simulate what a community threat assessment team is like, so you guys can see how these work. Um, I'm thrilled that we have on our board representation from some of the key anchor institutions that um, are on this community safety and security team. David Thompson here with the schools is key to that. We have people. We'll go through that list um, as we go through the meeting today. But there are people from key anchor institutions that participate in this process. As Mandy said, we started out with um, the events of Sandy Hook, Colin, oh, Columbine was a long time ago, but Sandy Hook, we had the Navy Yard um, killings, we had um, Aurora, and, and also we were in a very bad um, economic downturn where we had um, many people unemployed and, and, and a level of desperation in communities that we hadn't had. This also played out for our social workers who are dealing with families who are in these situations as well. So, this kind, this level of violence, this level of desperation also spills over into the work that our social workers do, work that our economic services workers do, our public health nurses. And so there was, we were finding ourselves meeting very frequently around um, potential threats that were um, in our community and directed at some of our employees. And again, I think a large part of this was due to the um, economic downturn, but we always have a background level of these going on. We've been doing threat assessment teams within health and human services probably now for about four or five years. 
And we found it to be very, very helpful. And through this process, we've had tremendous support from the Sheriff's Department. Um, Kevin Calhoun has been instrumental in sitting with us on these teams. And he, he really is um, a great liaison for the community at large. And as we started doing these teams, we started to realize that the in incidences that we were seeing in our, um, with our workers was just one of many incidences that were occurring throughout the community. And so this team is really centered on trying to look at any of those kinds of concerns that are directed at the community at large. Um, and that's what we're going to go through today. Does anyone, um, I probably should introduce our panel members before we get started. Rebecca, you want to start us off, Judge Knight, and tell us kind of your role on this team? Um, I'm Becky Knight. I'm a retired district court judge. I do uh, work with the county on different projects, and this is one of them. Uh, probably the role that I took was gathering and uh, the confidentiality statutes that go across the board from the different partners in the community um, and figuring out how they can work together lawfully to share information. I'm Angela Pittman. I'm the social work director, and so I represent that social work perspective, and Lisa's <coughs> talked about what we were seeing but also the larger health and human services perspective. And I am Kevin Calhoun, and I'm with the Sheriff's Office. And, uh, my role technically, I think, by MOU is that I am the chair. Uh, I've, I actually chair very little. These folks actually take care of everything that needs to be handled, and particularly Judge Knight with that facilitation of trying to get the, the pieces connected. Uh, but obviously, yes, I, I do delve more into the background information and the law enforcement related information and the key connections that we need to make there between different agencies and resources to take care of any issues. David Todd's our Director of Student Services for Buncombe County Schools. And as part of that, I, I work with all the, um, with a lot of agencies, um, mental health coordination from community agencies within the, the, across Asheville and Buncombe County. Uh, but also, you know, we, we run an internal risk, risk assessment process regarding students. That probably, once school gets started up, we'll probably do it two or three a week. Uh, when there's threats communicated internally. But my piece on this committee is actually looking at when there's, when those things that we identify may rise to a, a level of a community threat or when a community threat may impact schools or students that live in that community, then we are able to look at it from, from the kid perspective. And I'm Rich Munger. Um, I'm a planner evaluator on the human service support team, but I also happen to be a psychologist and hence, I think my role on this <coughs> this uh, group is um, to bring that perspective because, as you um, can guess, you know, a lot of these cases involve persons with substance abuse and mental health issues. Although we do also have Smoky Mountain Center at the table, usually in most of our meetings. Great. And another perspective, um, we have Judge Knight with her obvious legal expertise, but we do have attorneys as well, oftentimes as part of this committee. So. Um, so what are some of the pressures in our community? We have seen in North Carolina some of the restrictive mental health laws that have occurred and a lack of access to coordinated services. Uh, and so oftentimes we have people in our community who have pretty severe mental health issues that are not getting the, the services that they need. Um, we have um, a great veteran service center here, and so we have vets that are coming home, reintegrating, and they have their own set of challenges coming back from combat zones um, potentially re-entering with their family and into the community. <coughs> we want to make sure that we create good supports for them as they're trying to seek employment, medical care, and housing. Um, we have a pretty strong group of individuals in our community that believe in the sovereign state and the concept that they don't believe that our government was lawfully established. And so they um, bring to that a suspicion of any kind of law enforcement, and that in itself can uh, particularly cause issues potential issues of threat when you have them interacting with government officials. Um, we have the bullying that occurs in schools um, that, that, again, can escalate, as we've seen, unfortunately, to incidences of violence. And then, again, as I mentioned, mentioned was the unemployment that we saw uh, most recently. And, and in Buncombe County, we know from what Tom DeVee told us that unemployment actually was disproportionately affected the men in our community. Um, it was, um, I want to say, two-thirds higher, if that might be a, a slight higher the number, but a larger percentage of men in our community were disproportionately affected by the unemployment. And as we'll see in a minute, um, many acts of violence are committed by males. Um, what we know, and I'm going to talk about mass shootings, and this isn't really the focus of the community threat assessment team. I mean, our focus is to make sure that we create a safe environment for those individuals of concern and also for our community. 
But mass shootings are those things that happen along this continuum of violence, and there is good research that's been done to kind of identify who the mass shooters are and kind of the conditions. So I think it's good for that to inform the work that we're doing. 57% um, of reported mass shootings started with a domestic violence incident. And as you saw last um, board meeting when we were talking about the domestic violence initiative, this is huge. So these efforts start overlapping with each other. Um, the median age for um, a mass shooter is 36, and it's 100% male. Um, almost 60% of these people show some sign of mental illness, whether it's formal or, or informally reported. 81, almost 82% of these, um, the guns were actually legally obtained um, during the shooting. That graphic just um, is a graphic that shows the population distribution in the United States. And you can see that basically it, mass shooters are males and they tend to follow the population demographics. Now we don't have a lot of mass shooters, which is a good thing. So those numbers are a little wonky on the smaller um, uh, population numbers, but they generally follow the profile of the population. <coughs> Probably the most important thing, though, that we've learned from these um, mass shootings is that there was information already in the community that could have been used in a way that might have prevented the shooting. So Sharon West over at the VA Center might know something that Suzanne Swinger knows at the school, that um, Kevin Calhoun knows because of the law enforcement, but people aren't communicating with each other and they're not getting this picture emerging of what's happening. And so the whole purpose of this multi-anchor community threat assessment team is to bring key players to the table who would be most likely to be having contact with this individual in a way that we can use that information, again, to synthesize an understanding of what the current risk is and then to proactively try and do something about it. And it is, I like to use this image because I think it's a matter of distilling this, this image of the situation. We've got all these pieces of information. We have to have a structured way of seeing what we know and then going about to gather information where there's gaps, and then putting it together to get a picture of what is concerned. And we're using tools that have been used by the FBI and other um, agencies that allow us to do this in a best practice manner. Our goal is to get that picture, to still that picture, to get support for the person of concern. In many of these instances, this individual is in desperate need of care as well, and has some risk of safety for themselves. And then we also want to make sure that we support the individuals are in our community who are potentially affected by that individual. So those are the three goals. Um, so we've had to build a system where we can have a way for people to identify concerns and bring it to the team. Uh, we have to have a process for gathering those fa facts, making sure we've got the right people around the, the, the table, and we'll go through that. And then we need a plan for mitigating risk. So we've got to find ways to find and um, support and connect people to services and using all, everything that we have available, including family resources of the person of concern and any kind of community resource that we have. I'm just gonna stop yakking here for a second and see if anyone on the team wants to talk a little bit about some of those support processes or the way that we're gathering people or who we've got at the table. Anybody want anything? No? I think what we did, what was, what was key was in identifying who was brought to the table was we knew from, from uh, learning about the, the pieces of information that were out in the community after the fact, we learned that other folks were being impacted by some of these situations. So first of all, who are the organizations that are being impacted on a regular basis with that? Uh, what are the key, um, the key resources or, or organizations out in the community uh, that can provide the kind of assistance that we need to right someone's life, to deal with a particular situation and out of those people which of those had already some experience I know the county schools was a good example uh, who already had threat assessment teams in place could we migrate some of those people or key players in those programs and some of their um, some of their techniques that they use can we bring those to the table here to bring together in one place just in the same fashion that we're attempting to share information from the outside, we were able to share techniques and, and wisdom and experience. I think one of the things, and then Judge Knight can explain the complexity of the MOU, but if you look at the list of members that we have on the team, you can see that all of these organizations would have really vital information about people that might be important to protect the community and keep it safe. And so some of the members that come to this team can share information 
Uh, some of them can just receive information and not comment, and then others um, can have an exchange of information. And so you can imagine when you have this many in, uh, organizations um, who are governed by general statutes, both federal and state, how complex that can get around sharing information. And so Judge Knight um, will talk a little bit about how she pulled through um, that complexity for us. So just to make sure everybody understands, at this meeting, we do have to navigate um, the confidentiality law. So there are people that come to the meeting that never say anything. They just simply take information back. And if they're, for example, a mental health provider that's treating an individual of concern, they're going to use that information to make the best judgment they need to about what they need to do going forward with that individual. Likewise, the um, Sheriff's Department has access to the information that none of us have access to, but as the lead in this organization, they're going to be able to take all that information together and use um, the position that they have to do the best thing they can to keep the community safe. So um, I'm going to go on to the MOU since we're talking about that. Uh, the MOU memorandum, memorandum of understanding was created to really give the structure to how this team can work. Um, one thing that's very clear is probably that the schools were the leader nationwide in threat assessments, and that all started after the Virginia Tech shootings. And they authorized and directed schools to create threat assessment teams, and it was a great model. When I started researching it, they were really the only entity that had pretty much across the board, across the country, plans for dealing with students who were threatening. But mental health providers have threat assessment, as you heard, social services had threat assessment teams, law enforcement has threat assessment teams. This MOU is not to deal when the school has a problem with a student that they're handling in-house. Um, if they're able to handle it, it doesn't involve the team. But when any of our partners gets concerned that, oh, this might be affecting others in the community, we don't know where this is, um, you know, what is going on. And we bring everyone together. Um, there's different laws. I mean, you don't need to spend time today to talk about it. But basically, HIPAA has different requirements, and FERPA, the schools, has different requirements. And federal law is uh, very strict on substance abuse and mental health providers. Um, social services has different laws protecting confidentiality. But if you distill them down, basically, if there's a serious and imminent threat to a person, there's opportunity to share information. And so that is what we're looking at, is when we can establish there's a serious and imminent threat. So the whole um, purpose of the team is to bring lots of different folks together who may have information. And as Angie just said, sharing, you know, one partner may be able to share information. The other one might be a substance abuse provider who cannot share it at all. They can take information back and they can modify their treatment plan they don't, even have, they don't tell the team they even are dealing with that person, but they can modify how they're dealing with that individual internally, and that would certainly hopefully be a mitigation. But to lawfully share this information at the table and then get a group evaluation of um, you know, what are the issues, how can we do this, and it's just amazing when we're all at the table, especially having Rich um, being able to pretty quickly say, well, my guess is if there was a diagnosis, it would be this. And this is how the best way to handle someone with that type of diagnosis. And he's been pretty so far he's dead been on every time. <laughs> so that's been very because helpful. Because we do follow up with an evaluation. Right. Um, one of the key things in all of these laws is the ability to notify potential people at risk. So you can notify family members lawfully. You can notify neighbors. You can notify providers. Um, and so that is really a key point to let people in the greatest danger know. But obviously, if you're dealing with someone who's posted, you know, I'm going to go to the mall and get out as many as I can. I mean, you can't, you don't know who's going to be at the mall that day. So you have the general population protection, and then you have the, gen the specific. And then the other part, which has just been very um, heartwarming from my perspective, being in the court system where it's really guilty, not guilty, jail, not jail, you know, that type of thing is really focusing a lot of the energy and as much energy on how can we help this person? How can we access services? Who's a good contact person? Searching out relatives who may be able to reach that person. Um, and just trying to figure out what it is that they are so angry about or what their need is in needing that. And so that's been, that's really the purpose of the MOU is to create the structure for that to happen. And I, it's been 
quite successful in many cases. Did you, um, was there an MOU in the packet? Because I will say that um, it is the single best <coughs> consolidated reference to all the related law. When, when we pulled it because of a public information request lately, I was struck at what an amazing job you did pulling from all those different systems and creating one document that talks about what can or can't be shared in a situation of credit. So there are members of the board who might like to have um, ideally, long term, if we had some state and federal laws that created this ability to operate these teams, it would make it much easier for any community to implement it. When we did our research, we could not find anywhere in the country where this is being done. So this was really um, a first step. So I've already <coughs> taken the pleasure of me talking to Senator Van Dyne about that and maybe drafting some legislation that that she can push, and a, and a lot of it's gotta be federal because a lot of these laws are federal, but just giving communities a structure to do this, I, I think could really make a difference. One of the FBI agents after Sandy Hook said, a lot of people had a little bit of informa information, nobody had all the pieces to the puzzle. And so that's what we're doing, we're taking puzzle pieces and putting them together to get a real time, uh, present before tragedy <coughs> look at the situation. <laughs> I'll put puzzle pieces on our share box, by the way. I, <laughs> I think that that last point that Judge Knight is really crucial. To, I think there are two things that can get lost in all of this. One is that, that it is about the small pieces of information that people have that in, in and of themselves might not seem important. But when you bring them together and look at that constellation, that emerging picture, then you understand there's a clear picture for threat. Or you have a system in place where a new alarming piece of information comes in and, and you're quickly able to disseminate that information in a way that you can be responsive. And, and then the next thing I wanna just point out is that we're not just looking at, um, these are, when, when this rises to the community level, this is because the community is very upset. And most likely it's oftentimes dealing with someone who has mental illness such as um, paranoid schizophrenia that's not being treated in a way that you, you're not dealing with things in, in, in our normal approach. Um, and so it does require um, a, a wraparound kind of um, multidisciplinary team approach to the individual and the needs of the community. So, um, having said that, did you have more you want to add on this one? Well, this just to make it very clear that there is no effort in this process to undermine individual confidentiality and privacy rights. Um, it is totally focused on protecting an individual's right to privacy. Uh, it is. The second base is using evidence-based tools on risk assessment, and I think it's been mentioned the FBI um, really has developed some good risk assessment tools. And then sharing information when it's necessary um, and not sharing it if it's not necessary, just really focusing on the issue at hand and, and trying to address that issue. So those are the kind of the guiding principles we've looked at. And then Rich, you want to talk a little bit about what you've done? I mean, I think just even with the jail diversion, the CIT training, and the integration of a lot of these services across those different. Well, I think the key is that <coughs> the members of the team typically participate in the coalitions in the community. And as you know, we have lots of coalitions in Buckingham County. But they're very useful in that we attend these coalitions and share information. And we have extraordinary resources in this community. Critical aspect of that is knowing what they are. And members of this team know those resources so that if somebody needs housing, if somebody needs expedited mental health treatment, if someone needs a service over at the jail, we have jail diversion programs and other kinds of programs that a lot of people in the community just aren't aware of. And this team being a part of this broader community participation and coalitions, I think we can bring that information to bear very quickly and no, <clears throat> no set up the safety plan, which Lisa's going to say more about in a minute, um, which is vital to the whole process. Okay. So in addition to the information that we have from the um, people on the committee, we're also going out, and Kevin and his law enforcement department do a great job of bringing the concerns of the community to the team as well, because this, again, this is a community safety and security team, so getting information from individuals, neighbors, family members, mental health providers, local agencies, the schools, uh, looking on social media, all of those things that we've seen in the news that are important areas for getting that kind of information um, that we are trying to access again in a proactive manner through this um, safety team. 
Um, along with that, with the information, you've got to find a way to use that information that's um, confidential, but also can be readily accessed. And Kevin's going to talk about the SharePoint site that we're developing. We tried, I'm sorry, we were trying to get it brought up for you today, but we had some technical difficulties. Yeah, we intended to let you see it. But. So how many, I imagine there's quite a few people that are using SharePoint, part of, within county government in particular, and you've probably already seen that it's a pretty stable platform. It's something we can uh, probably depend on for a long time to come. Well, that was the first and foremost thing that jumped out at us is that it is going to be the base for a lot of information exchange here in the county for a long time. It's uh, already in use. It has the ability to establish a secure location where um, a lot of sources of that of, of uh, digital transfer of information like that aren't able to do. For instance, with SharePoint, we were able to set up an outside of the county intranet website which allowed other agencies and our our participants at the table here as part of the MOU to communicate on a website that was linked to our SharePoint and secured by our SharePoint to maintain that security of information but at the same time facilitate that whole transfer of information to and from that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Um, it becomes a great conduit for that. Our Objective is to is to continue to learn more and more and, and put it in place more and more so that uh, we do have our partners uh, able to do that on a more frequent basis. It's just at this point it's still a design and uh, implementation project for us. So we hope that we'll be able to roll that out soon to you and you'll be uh, able to see that that's actually going to serve as the absolute hub for this exchange of information between these folks. And and again. In dealing with the legal aspects of it, you know, it will provide that kind of secure location where we can put up the information, we can notify folks, for instance, of an, uh, a meeting that is, needs to take place here soon, <laughs> or we can ask them at large as a group, is this information something you're interested in, or you, can you provide additional details concerning this event or series of events in this neighborhood or associated with this person, and still be uh, very much uh, protected from our disclosing information that we should. And we have varying levels of access on that site for people as well. So there's, again, it's the management of flow of information. Some people might see only this much, other people, you know, Kevin will see this much, I might only see this much. So um, there's different levels of um, security as well on the site. And it also gave us a place to, I, I spent some time with in the last few days, um, creating a location where we could share just news and resources, tools for us to be able to use that you may find that we use in the school program. I may find that we lose use in the law enforcement. Um, we may find that, uh, for instance, the, the threat assessment processes, we tended to gravitate from the start toward the Department of Justice. Uh, I then got some training, spent some time working with the National Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, so mine have a little different flavor to it. Um, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be a good location, too, where we could take all these multidisciplinary approaches as we have them in writing and in a training uh, packet of some nature, put that on our SharePoint site. So we'll try to do that as well, provide those resources, so that now we're also not absorbing everyone's resources, we're dishing them right back out to try to help all of you. And again, to give some context to this, David said when school starts up, they'll have two to three threat assessment teams a week. This week in Health and Human Services, we've had three. Um, and they come and go, but you know, each institution that's sitting at that table is having their own individual threat assessment teams within their organizations to make sure that they're um, you know, doing their best to um, proactively manage risk. So the whole safety plan of this committee is about having a way to bring these concerns forward. So we have key members at, um, on that committee who have those small pieces of information that can get that out to us as needed, or if we say we have a concern about an individual, does anyone have information on that individual? We can get that information back. We gather the information through a team process. We come together, we meet. We use a very structured process, this uh, threat assessment team process, which you all will be doing in just a second in your groups. We evaluate risk, we evaluate the information, looking for what we have, what's missing, we go out and investigate, Kevin goes out, investigates, gets more information, and we implement a safety plan. And again, that safety plan is not just for the community, but it's also for the individual of concern. And then we monitor and communicate. We figure out who needs to be in this communication loop. How do we, who needs to be getting these, this information? 
we make sure that we do that through an iterative <coughs> process. So um, we are going to stop for a second. I'm going to have any ask for any questions at this point, and then we're going to run through a threat assessment team process, and I'll give you directions on that. But does anybody have questions about the team, the purpose of it, what we're trying to do, or suggestions? At what point might a referral of this person be to local services? I mean, I, I know you're focusing on the threat, and sometimes it's hard to get beyond that and see that this person needs these services. How do you get them to those services? I think it actually works, and I don't mean to jump in, but I think it actually works in reverse for us. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that we look at it more from the standpoint of what does this person need and how can we get it to them? And by and large, the other pieces to that from a violence standpoint seem to start to fall into place for us. Is that, is that fair? I mean, safety first, and then what are services that will help mediate that, that risk and make the situation more safe? So it's really about the services that you can bring to bear. It's a, it's a, a, to tell you the truth, sometimes I don't like wearing a uniform, if that helps. But, because I don't want the focus to be on something we discussed earlier. I don't want folks to see this as a law enforcement task force. It yeah. is not yeah. that. It is purely designed to try to organize those resources and bring them to bear on that person's current state of health and let's see what we can do to eliminate possible risks of violence and things in the future. It, it, yeah. um, our biggest challenge, however, is and that a number of these individuals that, that, that come to our attention um, are mentally ill. And they have a phenomenon, if you have a psychotic illness, you've got about a one in three chance of not, real, one of the symptoms of your illness is you don't understand you have an illness. Mm -hmm. And that is a real challenge for us. It's not everybody with mental illness, but people with very severe psychotic illnesses, it's not uncommon. And I would say we've confronted that on a number of occasions, and that's a challenge because our focus is how can we help this person if they don't think they need help. So that's a challenge, and we deal with that day to on a day by day basis. There's no secrets to how you can deal with that. And for many of these individuals, they have we're, our point is that we don't want them to break the law. We want to get to them before they break the law, so they're living in our community. So we want to make sure that whatever we're doing for those individuals are making them as stable and it's safe for them to live productively in our community. So again, that's the focus of what we're trying to do. And it, it's a learning process as we go along. So any other questions or concerns? Okay, so um, what we were gonna do is we thought we'd actually run you through a quick threat assessment team process. And so we, were, we have you broken up into three different tables and I'll tell the board members what they need to do in a second. But we have a scenario. Um, I don't know if you guys have had time to read it. We're going to give everybody a chance to read the scenario. And I'd like to say that this scenario is an exaggeration of what we deal with, but unfortunately, this will give you an idea of kind of what rises to the level of a community threat assessment. So I'd, I'd like you to read this scenario, and then each, we have a five-page threat assessment team structure process. We're not going to have each group go through that. Each group is going to take one part of that process and go through that with a team leader. And then we're going to come back together and bring all that information together as a group and come up with our own plan about how we might mitigate risk going forward with this individual. So if anybody have questions about that part of it? So we have, I think, 12, roughly 12 board members here. Well, okay, so, so one, two, Can we four, get him to join six, us up here? Eight, we're getting ready to spray So I think about 12. So, no, well, we're getting ready to. Oh. What I need is I need, um, like, four board members to go to that table, four board members to stay <laughs> here. Board for you go over there, and then you need to boot somebody out of that table. <laughs> you need to take somebody's chair and boot them over here. If that makes any sense. So who, who I think you need to try hard to okay. keep well, some extra four. piece of the from different areas. Oh, well. okay. Social work, health, and so on. So we need four that can be over here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Anything else that, that indicates there's a mental health issue?
we've seen is not even hit. So that you know the potential for harm.
kind of thing, because there's a lot of that. There are times when we've threat assessments, and our very sensitive is someone taught. We don't have any authority to assess the parents on threat. But we've become aware of the fact that the child is threatened and caused a threat in the home. Lisa needs to uh, yeah. need our attention again, and I'm sorry to break in because this is quite an interesting session. So, Lisa? Yeah, so um, I'm glad it sounds like there was really good discussion that went on. I thought what we might do is just um, talk through just a few of the things that struck you um, about, well, let's just talk through about the process so far. Did you guys find the process interesting or helpful? What were some of the observations you might have about this process? Well, it certainly makes it more personal and it, it resonates so much more strongly. Is that what you mean, the process of what we do here or the this I'm actually process. using the tool. Like, oh, using what, the what, tool. Did you find the tool useful? Was it was it um, uh, helpful, or was did it get in the way of the discussion, or did you think it was important to actually go through those different items that you had? As a, from what I do for a living, I do postmortems, and, and I always like to keep a systematic sheet as a checkoff. And and I think it's a good idea to say, you know, we're going to go down this list. It's like a pilot. Though. And it's not that tool as much as just that there's a tool. Yeah, we were discussing too how that is a tool that I might use to present with the group at large, but I have a separate tool that I use on my own at different check blocks and there are different things that I might want to ask to uh, develop or distill that picture. I think it gives all voices equal weight because that there isn't a decision point and it allows for everyone to question Whoever the authority is in, in the group, there's, a, there's an equal, equi what the word I want? Equitable. equitable dispersion of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the psychologist doesn't get more authority than the sheriff mm -hmm. because each of them brings a different perspective. So mm -hmm. that, that equalizes it somewhat. Anything from the table over there? Mm -hmm. You guys had Kevin, you probably went off road, I bet. Condenses your thoughts. Well, just to play devil's advocate though, is there anything about having a tool like this though that causes you to maybe escalate escalate a problem that doesn't exist? You, you know what, what I'm it saying? It gives you, it gives you a, 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 the ability to identify what you need to investigate. There may be, th those questions may not be answerable, but when you ask them, you know what you need, what you need to find out. Okay, but I mean, you, you know, it's like, like the rumor that you start that then gets echoed back to you, it kind of gets reinforced. Is there anything about this process that maybe reinforces a situation that doesn't exist? I think, I think that's a really good question to ask, that are we creating, by being fearful, do you create fear almost? Right. It's like, and it's, what I would say is that Kevin um, is the one that calls these meetings together for the most part, but he does a lot of legwork before we ever get together as a group. But I think that's a potential in this thing. And that's why I think it's important to use structured tools where we're looking at objective facts versus people's feelings and intuitions, paying attention to those things as well. But what is their previous history of violence? Is, are there weapons in the home? Are these things that we know based on research really escalating things, really a part of the situation or not? But then I think you always have to be constantly reevaluating that picture, that you get a, you know, some information, you go and you investigate and you have to reassess. And again, we are not answering these things with force, we're really answering these things with support and resources for people to be productive members in our community. And again, if it's a teenager that's gone offline and is dark and is, it is being and isolating that himself, we're gonna go to the schools and make sure that we're, get, we're intervening early enough that we can get that child services that will help them do okay and stay in school. 
Likewise with an individual, it's the same thing. But I, I think we have to always safeguard, and that's why you have courts, and you have structured other processes that say, do, should you or should you not be involved with this individual? I that, think that the structure, sense. I'm sorry to interrupt, mm -hmm. but the, the structure itself wins a hand toward that. Right. I, I might come at things, and I know from the, from the get-go in this project, I was convinced that this was uh, problematic for law enforcement to take the helm or, or be any type of a, uh, uh, a chair or anything of that nature without some balance. I soon realized that the structure itself was going to provide that balance. And what happens now is that regardless of the information, regardless of what we're meeting about, the fact is we're meeting and the different disciplines uh, are bringing those different viewpoints to what facts we present and are, we're challenging one another. We are challenging one another in most of these meeting environments. Is it really though something, just because we found X, do, can we make that leap that Y is about to occur? And I, I think, like I, like I said, the, the setup of the, of the MOU itself kind of lends to, lends to you know, preventing that from happening. And having Rich on the team, um, there may be a piece of information that's really creepy that Rich can say, you're right, it's creepy, it's not dangerous. It's just creepy, you know, it's just, you know, and so having his expertise has helped us a lot of times from maybe something that I would very judgmentally look at or law enforcement might look at from a di different perspective, and he's able to give us the, that's not a danger factor. Um, but he's also at times pointed out danger factors that we didn't recognize, so, you know, it, it works both ways. I think we also really use the resources we have. Like Kevin Turner is great um, in dealing with veterans. He has a great relationship with them. Um, and if we've got, our goal is to make sure our veterans who absolutely deserve the very best come back and are able to um, come back to this community and have a good job and get the resources they need. And so we lead with that, you know. Um, we're gonna lead with David, understanding how he can use his counselors in a way, again, that can can help intervene in that situation. And David may come back and say, everything's okay. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. Um, and we, there have been instances when Kevin calls and says, I think we're gonna need a community threat assessment team. And then I get a call later on and he said, nope, not necessary, we handled it. And so I, I do think that we haven't had that many of these. There's been five to date, I believe. And um, we've intervened in strongly in only I think three of them. That's about right. Other questions? I don't have a question, but to me, this list is a great indicator of predictability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we do a lot of preventive measures and trying to help with that. But this instrument is everybody can get this particular thing and say, I have a particular situation. This person needs help. Mm -hmm. To me, as I was looking at this and answer, listening to the answer to the question it is a very predictable you have a problem and it's a good answer so what kind of resources would you get this individual and this family when you think about us being also a health and human services board and county <coughs> want to intervene especially for that 13 year old son who's yeah. really looks like he needs David was talking about what he would do from a school perspective it sounds like both of those things could incite a reaction <laughs> yeah, we would work in reaction immediately after but we, we would work closely with with protective services about what, what they're doing so that we're not duplicating it but we would want to make sure that they were connected to mental health services and supports in schools you know, we're working on, on doing some trauma informed practices in the schools. This is a this kid's experience some trauma, and how do we avoid his triggers, and how do we how do we put supports in place for him at the school site? So one of the things you bring up is that inflection point, and that's another thing about this threat assessment team process is really having that communication loop in place so that when there's an inflection point, like taking custody of kids, mom moving out because of domestic violence, and finally deciding she's going to go to helpmate. Uh, dad losing his job, that there's somebody who's in the communication loop that can say, risk may have escalated, we need to pay attention, so. It would be 
good to know that John is taking advantage of the services that are available to him through the VA. Absolutely, absolutely. And that'd be one thing that we would pull out our ace in the hole, Kevin Turner, and get him connected to Kevin. And he probably might already, Kevin might already know him, um, or, or not, so. He was a contractor. You know, which we, we, had a, we had an argument of whether he was actually in the military. Yeah, that's because it starts off saying he wasn't, okay. and then at the end it said he's getting VA services. Well, that's so that we didn't know yet on that. Okay, thank you. That we was didn't me. know for sure, but we... That was Lisa Evie working late at night and no, not realizing what Kevin said. So he was demilitarized. So. <laughs> but, you know, I got, I got a call uh, last week from someone who was very upset because they weren't getting seen as quickly as they needed to by the VA um, after a trip to the emergency room. And then I found out, but he didn't go to the emergency room at the VA. The VA had no idea that this guy was as sick as he was. All he did was ask for an appointment. And so, you, you know, I, I just jumped to the conclusion, and, and I think he did too, that he wasn't getting the services he deserved. And we didn't, we didn't make a simple connection like, well, maybe you need to go to the ER at the VA so that they know how sick you are and then solve the problem. Right. Kevin takes a lot of those off our plate. <laughs> right. We'll try. So. All right. Well, that's just a, a, we, we were going to go through a communication plan and kind of summarize the whole thing. But I think uh, due to the interest of time, because I know there's a lot of other business that needs to be held today, that we'll, we'll leave this unless anybody has any closing comments. I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you also look at situations where people are a danger to themselves as opposed to other people. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because I did read a, a, a statistic once that there are twice as many suicides in this country every year as homicides. A hundred a day. And that kind of stunned me because we never talk about suicide. And is it 28 a day are veterans? It's 22 a day. 22 a day. Wow. hundred suicides a day in our country and 22 a day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thanks, the, the team. Let's stay where you are because we have some business that we need to do. And, and, uh, um, but, uh, yeah, I got to get my stuff. Just hold a minute because, uh, Jim, I think we need to have a quickie on the finances, if you would, sir. Good afternoon. From your packet, you should see, or on your iPhone or iPad, you should see uh, two sets of financials. We're going to wrap up in the FY14 fiscal year, and we're starting the FY15 fiscal year. So, somewhere, these are. Well, I'm just going to talk through these. So, uh, for FY14, the as, as you know, in putting the budget together, one of the things that we always try to do is to make sure it's good. that we're uh, driven by the work in making sure that we accomplish the goals that are the core public health, core DSS functions that we are required by law, policy, or statute to do. And I'm happy to report that uh, through this year, we were able to do that from a budget perspective and meet all of those obligations. Uh, in the DSS world, just talking first about DSS, how DSS expenditures go are mostly driven by uh, federal policy or state policy that's enacted that we implement. How that works is if some of, some of those things are not uh, authorized or spent, those dollars don't get spent. So when you look at an FY14 expenditure and you see emergency assistance didn't spend 100% of what it was budgeted, do we not provide emergency assistance? No, that simply means that because of the policies that we were implementing, we were not able to use the full dollars that we had anticipated to make available for budgeting. Uh, likewise, in terms of revenue generating revenue, we have to make sure that we, uh, the way in the DSS world, 99% of the way revenues come forward are based on expenditures. So if you spend the dollars, you get the revenue back. And whatever the difference is represents the county contribution towards uh, operating the DSS. Happy to report that in both of those, we, were, we met within our budget, both on the expenditure side and on the revenue side, and we're not uh, 
in any, in any deficit in either salary and benefits, operating program costs, or in capital expenditures. Uh, likewise, for public health, we did we're the same thing. It's a little bit different, as you know, on revenues versus expenditures. Revenues are mostly, in, especially in the clinical world, are driven by uh, billings and uh, reimbursements for that. We actually, because of Medicaid and a Medicaid cost settlement, we actually realized more revenue than we anticipated. Now that sounds great, and that's, that is a great thing. The, if you've been a part of the board or part of this uh, group, you know that one of the things that with Medicaid revenues that we've had to uh, experience <coughs> is the cost settlement portion of Medicaid, which means that they settle us at the state and federal level based on what our actual costs are. They give us additional Medicaid reimbursement. The state calculates that number for us. Uh, we are every year constant, consistently audited by the Division of Medical Assistance for that cost settlement. The state is. We realized that for one of our uh, cost settlement years that we needed to have a contingency of dollars in order for potential payback. That audit was still in process and has not been closed. So those revenues that we realized will be carried over as a contingency for next year in case we do have to meet an audit payback. Again, that's uh, literally out of our control because that's handled both the calculation of what our settlement <coughs> should have been and the payment is handled at the state level and it's not something that the county was responsible for, for doing. But likewise with public health, we were able to stay within our, both our budget uh, from the expenditure side and the revenue side. I'm happy to entertain any questions about FY14. I spent a lot of time on 14 because there's really not a lot to say in FY15. We're one month into the fiscal year, a little over 8%, and I'm happy to say one month in, we're right on target. <laughs> so, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Good job. Thanks very much. As a, as a board, we're extremely proud of action that we get each year from our uh, finance department and, and all of the budget flows and thank you so much for all the work that all of you do in order to make that possible. Okay, uh, that brings us to the advisory reports. We have some uh, policies that we have to approve uh, and I guess Philip or Philip? Mr. Philip, I'll say two things. Those policies went out to you ahead of time and they've all been approved and come to you as recommendations from your advisory committees. So other folks working on the, the technical practice detail of those before they come to us. And that is correct. Uh, the one policy that we have from the uh, Economic Services Advisory Committee is our LEAP policy, uh, Low Income Energy Assistance Program. Uh, it's a plan that we have, an outreach plan that we have to do every year. Uh, the reason it's coming to you this year is because of legislative change that required uh, the Board of Health and Human Services or DSS to approve those plans. And uh, you should have a copy of that plan. It's really about how we go about informing people of energy funds that exist out there. Uh, we're lucky in this community that we have the Beacon Network or the Buncombe Emergency Assistance Coordinating Network, which meets every every month uh, with many community partners involved in that in that network that is our outreach plan when it comes to energy programs because a lot of those partners also do uh, the work and approve energy plans so it's really not a lot to say other than we use that beacon network to do our outreach the plan has been submitted and we need the board approval thank you phil any questions policy itself. Do I have a motion that we accept it as presented? So moved. I had a whisper over oh, whisper. Oh, <laughs> she, <laughs> she has a little bit of trouble. Oh, with have <laughs> so she said, moved and seconded by Richard. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 So all opposed same sign. So be it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Okay, now we have uh, 
I think, Don, you're going to present uh, five of, of 11 and, uh, or six, six, six of the 11, six and, and 11. we'll get the other five next time. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is uh, actually the less exciting part of our duty as a public health advisory committee. Uh, and I have to tell you that uh, uh, the director had me reading these things on Sunday afternoon, and I, we were back and forth as we were, I was asking her questions. Uh, and only because there was a golf tournament on did I get them finished because I let nothing separate me from 60 minutes. <laughs> but as you, uh, as you probably already know, uh, there are several things that drive the policies that we have in uh, public health. Um, one is to provide clear direction to the uh, staff. Uh, we also have a lot of contract agreements with the North Carolina Division of Public Health, and we also have accreditation standards which have to be upheld. So we have over 50 administrative policies in public health that uh, are used to guide and direct these activities. Uh, 11 of those, as the chair stated, uh, 11 of the administrative policies require HHS board review and, uh, and approval, and you had six of those in your packet before today. Uh, the Public Health Advisory Committee has reviewed them and we bring them to you as a recommendation. The first one is the adjudication policy, and I'm not going to read all of these. Uh, the second one is ob observing laws and regulations utilized in support of public health. The third one is media and public requests for information. Uh, rabies exposure policy is the fourth one. The fifth one is the smoke-free education and the enforcement of those acts. And the final one is uh, writing and revision policies and procedures. Mr. Chair, I move approval of the six administrative policies that the board received in that packet. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Richard. Any uh, questions? No, sir. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you. And we have, a, uh, we have a, another very small part of, that we'd like to do. I think you are, have heard, every one of you knows that we received the uh, Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation Culture of Health Prize. And what we would like to do today is to share with you a pen which says Culture of Health uh, that was given to all of us in Princeton. And we asked them if we could get enough to uh, provide all of our board members with a pen. So uh, Gibby is distributing those, and we hope you'll wear them proudly. And this serves as your invitation to the celebration activity on September 26th for the prize. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations. I'm sure we'll wear it with pride. Uh, that brings us to uh, Angie. Do you have anything? I don't have a report. We will meet uh, next week. Thank you. All right, uh, Lisa, she's already. Uh, she's gone. Terry's, Terry's gone, Frank's gone. I don't guess we're gonna have a report from that group either. So that brings us to director's report. I'm gonna be quick. Um, I do wanna just quickly report because it's something we'll be dealing with as a board as we move forward, the county's early retirement plan. Um, today, today's the last day for individuals to choose who are eligible to um, take advantage of that. Um, about 127 countywide and about 60 of those are uh, pretty close to half in health and human services. I feel like we're moving on the pieces we need to do about recruitment and hiring and looking at opportunities to improve system response. That's really not my agenda today. I do want to recognize the people in the room. Um, Table. God, it's good. <laughs> Who are taking advantage of that? Just ask them to stand up and as a board have the opportunity to thank them. I hate to start with Galen, but Galen is one of those. Um, Galen, yeah, stand up. Make yeah. all stand up until we applaud.
time. So that means everybody in this room who might be eligible now cannot sign up between now and five o'clock because you didn't get yourself recognized. The last thing that's in your package that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but we encourage you to take a look at, is um, we did. I thought Jim's team working with department heads did a great job of laying out the legislative impact on all the health and human services, both from a program perspective and what that's going to mean to individual consumers. I'd also ask you to spend some time, and we'll talk about this in the next year, from page six to nine, which details all, of, or, or 10, which de um, eight, details all the study commissions that will happen in, by order of the General Assembly over the next year that impacts services and programs, and how we want to actively be in, involved in shaping the outcome of those study commissions. So that is the direction. Probably close to 130, 129. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I look at the people who are taking it. Congratulations, oh, yeah. but Lord, I, what are we going to do? But uh, my fine people have done some great work, uh, and we hate to see you go, but we congratulate you for having the opportunity to do so and have a good retirement. Uh, and, and as do we have any uh, public comments? Anybody sign up? No. Okay. Uh, on the executive committee report, just quickly, we spent our time listening to the uh, retirement process as well as budget setup and so forth. And uh, you've heard a lot of what we what we discussed in, in that meeting. Uh, do we have any announcements anybody needs to make? Do I have a motion that we adjourn? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Do I have a second? Second. Right. Who said second? Don? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you all for moving around.